Hey, what is up, wrestling friends and family? It is me, JB, and the best Chris in all of wrestling podcasts, Mr. Chris Dredd. And today we have a very special guest. He is the author of Nitro. He's also the co-author of Grateful with Eric Bischoff and Sitting Ringside, Volume 1 with Dave Dave Penza. It's Guy Evans. Holy shit, Guy, welcome to the show. We really do appreciate you coming on, man. Oh, no, it's a pleasure to be here, guys. Really looking forward to talking with you, and uh, thanks for the invite. It's, this is a treat for me. Like I said, I've just held up the book, like, for those that aren't watching, of course, like, and, I mean, what a hefty book this is, and it is all about Monday Nitro, you know, the times we had, Chris. Oh. Yeah. It, you know, phenomenal times, man. Absolutely, you know, remember TNT, you know, we used to get that in the UK, and it was Nitro, mm-hmm. it was there. Before the movie started, we had Nitro. It was brilliant. Let's dive into this this new book, Guy. Uh, you, mm-hmm. it, it came out, what, last week? Was it this week? Yeah, so actually this is the first uh, time that I've spoken about it. We just uh, released a new book, David Penza and myself. Of course, he was the former ring announcer for WCW and also TNA later on. And David and I have been working together for over a year. Um, we first sort of got in contact actually way back when I was doing the nitro book, he was one of the people I interviewed for it, but then we sort of reconnected last year, um, because I had noticed that David was sort of putting it out there that he had kept, kept, uh, onto a lot of documents and formats and scripts and production notes and things like that from back in the day. And he didn't really know, I think at the time what to do with it. Uh, and so we got talking about maybe collaborating on a project and that turned into, you know, really two books in one. So setting ringside volume one is it's an, an autobiography, but it's also supplemented with, I think over 200 pages of some of those bonus materials that I just talked about, including actually the last ever format for WCW nitro, um, which has, you know, never been seen before. Right. So exactly what everyone was looking at that fateful night in, uh, Panama City Beach. So, yeah, that's hot off the press last week, uh, Dave Penzer and I, and uh, getting a really good response so far. So happy about that. Before we move any fur- any further forward, you can get that at GuyEvansBooks.com. There will be a link underneath, of course there will. And we cannot wait to get our hands on it. Mate, I've, yeah. I've been following Dave Penzer on Facebook for a while, and he has he's, he's always putting up sort of like, um, you know, these photographs from back in the day mm. where he's with this person or that person and telling sort of a little story. And like you say, he was alluding to sort of not knowing what to do with the pictures and the and the bits right. and bobs. So, yeah, I mean, it, it really excited for that one guy, to be honest, mate. Fantastic stuff. Yeah, I mean, w- when we first got talking, the initial idea was let's do some sort of scrapbook. You know, let's find a home for these photos that you mentioned, these scripts, etc., Um, But once we really got into it, I realized that David actually has a fascinating life story. And, you know, when you think about the Monday Night Wars or you think about WCW in particular, of course, you think about the big names that we all know and you want to hear their perspective on things. But I think oftentimes you forget that someone like the ring announcer who was literally ringside for all of these events and obviously you know, traveling on the road with everyone and behind the curtain, you know, sometimes they have the most interesting perspective of them all. Uh, And, you know, David was, and I think you'll see this when you get into the book, just incredibly honest. And I think very fair and balanced in terms of how he evaluated everything. And, you know, some of his thoughts on, you know, people like Eric Bischoff and Kevin Sullivan and, uh, you know, even Roddy Piper, There's, there's so many great sections of the book where he really gives you insight about these people that i don't think um you know is is common in a lot of wrestling books so uh really really uh looking forward to you guys you know letting me know your thoughts on that i think you're you're really going to enjoy it man is it is it i we're really excited man i don't know you we're smiling from here to here because we can't wait guy to be honest mate it's you know even when you say dave penza even when you Mm. mention his name i can hear his voice because Mm. we've you know, it, it's yeah. it's synonymous with with that sort of era. You know, and it you'd always have. You know, and now we join in the ring, Dave Penza. You know, mm-hmm. they would always say that in commentary, and they'd always mention him. And like you say, he would have been there on the road, mm-hmm. some crazy road stories. You know, and um, mm-hmm. ringside uh, everything. Uh, so yeah, it is a different viewpoint. 
and Dave probably is not sort of like wrestlers probably do. They they've sort of like got the old uh, how do we say cover their own ass sort of. <laughs> right. You, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. they've got an ulterior motive to sort of make themselves look good in telling mm. any sort of story. But Dave, I would imagine doesn't really have that and doesn't really need that. No, not at all. And, you know, as you were saying that, it's funny that you mentioned road stories. I think we have a 8,000 word chapter, sort of a standalone chapter going into some of the most insane <laughs> stories from the 90s in WCW that David, some of them he's mentioned a little bit before and others, you know, it, it's a first time coming out in the book. But, but no, you're right. You know, he was actually the only person, uh, as far as we can tell, to be, uh, to have an on-screen presence at every nitro thunder and pay-per-view for that entire era right so a lot of people Insane. came and went yeah a lot, a lot of people came and went a lot of people were big parts of the programming for a while and maybe had you know a hiatus here or there but he was there for the whole thing um and i think you know as you were saying that it got me thinking about some of the other autobiographies that are out there in the in the wrestling genre and of course there's many great ones but i think the best ones are when the author holds their hand up at times and and doesn't try to portray themselves as infallible or the greatest thing since sliced bread, but actually says, you know what, I made a mistake here, or, or I was short-sighted, or this was a weakness of mine. And David does that consistently throughout the book. And so uh, in talking to him, that really helped me develop my, my trust in his credibility that he was going to really be earnest and forthcoming about his recollections. Because to your point, Chris, he wasn't looking for a vehicle just to, as they say in the wrestling business, put himself over, right? Absolutely. I think, I think he's been very, you know, it's an overused term, but he's been very vulnerable and very transparent and open about, um, you know, some of his shortcomings at times as well. So I, I yeah, I, I really think people, if you love the Nitro book, then it's it's in a very similar, you know, writing style and, and a very similar approach, I, I think, in this book as well. Chris is absolutely right. It's something you wouldn't consciously probably notice. But Dave Pence's Dave Pence's name probably gets announced on every show, and that's more mm -hmm. than some wrestlers would get announced on the show. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's literally like, yeah, they they cut to you know, let's go to Dave Pence. You wouldn't listen out for it, but I guarantee if you did it on a random Nitro Thunder, whatever, you'd hear it like three or four or five times. Yeah. And yeah, yeah that's and I... more than the the superstars would get announced. That's right, and and just think about. You know, this scene, if you can picture it, and I remember talking to David about this and it made me realize how much this guy has seen, uh, you know, they would have an announcer's trailer prior to every Nitro and Thunder where, you know, some of the more legendary names in the business would would be in there. The Bobby, the Brain Heenans, the Mean Gene Oaklands, you know, you'd have, of course, Tony Schiavone and Mike Tanay, Dusty, all of these kind of people. You know, WCW really had kind of an all-star announce team, didn't they, back in the day? And, you know, Dave was a fly on the wall for all of that. So, you know, for two, three hours, a couple of times a week, he's sitting there in that trailer, listening to these guys share stories and make each other laugh. And, you know, he remembers all of that in great detail because he was a huge wrestling fan. I mean, it, it was his dream since the age of 11 to be in the business in some way, shape or form. And all of a sudden he finds himself in this position where he's hanging out and in the room on a, you know, uh, on almost a daily basis with people that he grew up watching and so someone sort of called the book you know it's the ultimate fly on the wall account it's almost like what if the the ultimate wrestling fan actually found them their way you know to the big time and that's kind of what happened with david so he has some amazing stories to share about a lot of those people does it cover much of the TNA run? Uh, Chris is a massive was, TNA guy. I was so, literally yeah. going to ask that as well. You <laughs> took the words out of my mouth. Sorry. I was going to ask that because there was some crazy <laughs> shit went on there too. Well, it's funny you guys mentioned that. So originally we were just going to do one book, but once it became clear how much there was that David had to say just about his personal and professional life all the way up until WCW going out of business, um, not to mention all of those sort of bonus materials that I talked about before, we said at some point, you know what, this is going to have to be volume one of two, because if we go into the TNA stuff and, you know, David was also a big part of the XWF, that short lived, you know, promotion in the wake of WCW. He was very, very involved in that and and has a lot. He's held on to a lot of stuff uh, relating to that company as well. And so we, we decided, 
you know, rather than making this kind of a footnote or maybe a chapter or two, you know, by the way, this is what happened after 2001. I mean, David was working with TNA as recently as the end of last year, right? So there's there's a whole, you know, there's 22 years of his career still to cover. And that's what we're going to be going into in, in volume two. And similarly, he has tons of stuff from TNA, you know, scripts for episodes of Impact and things like that. He has the XWF uh, financials and the initial business plan that they all sat down and looked at in 2001. He's kept on to all of this stuff. So wow. that really helps in, in, in making this a unique project as well as he's not just going by his memory, which as we know, you know, for, for all of us can be faulty at times. He's actually able to make reference to the cold hard facts in front of him as well. So uh, October this year is when we're dropping uh, volume two and we'll be getting into TNA in, in a lot of detail. Oh, just around my birthday, Guy. What a present that is for me, my friend. <laughs> well, that's why that's why we chose October, to be honest with you. Though, oh, Chris. I mean, thank you, man. You don't need to. You're putting me over now, man. Come on. <laughs> I mean, we, we've been lucky enough to talk to someone who was in the XWF, you know, at mm. the time. And we got a, I mean, it was only a tiny glimpse into yeah, what yeah. was going on there at the time and what, what how, and his, his journey. But. I mean that XWF stuff as well seemed pretty wild too. So it'll be uh be really interesting well, for us to dive in. Yeah, we did yeah, we did I mean, a whole it, thing on the oh, shows, yeah, yeah as well. So. Yeah, we did a whole thing on the show, and it was another Brit we had on guy. We had um Ian Harrison um oh, okay. on. so absolutely fantastic guy, wasn't he, mate? He was yeah, what a gentleman, yeah. An absolute yeah. gentleman, do you know what I mean? But um yeah, he told us a few bits and bobs about what was going on backstage and stuff and you know, where mm. the wrestling world was at that time. But to have sort of um dave's uh view on that as well and obviously like you say the the actual meat of of the stuff you know the the, the mm. documents the the numbers um that's absolutely fascinating um absolutely fascinating yeah and you know it, it's funny because david only lives about 20 minutes away from me here in tampa and what brought him here was the xwf right so he he was in this position and we we touch on this a little bit in the book Obviously, we end the story 2001, but we do kind of mention that, you know, WCW closed down. David was given eight months of severance pay. And so for that entire period, of course, he's thinking about, well, you know, what's next? Am I going to be working in the wrestling industry anymore? Um, do I need to go and find a job doing something else? Because obviously at that time, I think people were quite pessimistic about the future of wrestling, right? It's like now we're in a position where there's a monopoly effectively. Uh, TV networks were not interested after WCW's collapse of, uh, you know, putting a, a rival promotion on the air. And so as fate would have it, I think with about two or three weeks left on his severance pay, you know, uh, Dave got the the opportunity to to help set up the XWF, which was based in Tampa. And so he moved his whole family, you know, at that time from Georgia um, to this area, and he's been there ever since. So, you know, it's, it's quite interesting because sometimes, I suppose I'm speaking for everyone here, but you know, from my point of view, we don't often think about sort of the implications of these things, right? Like when there's a new company or there's a new initiative being set up, how it how it's sort of a very defining or, or, or turning point in someone's life. Um, and, and obviously David made a big commitment to take his young family and move them to a different state at that time, um, only for it to to close down, you know, in fairly short order. So, um, you know, for people to learn about how he picked himself back up after that point and how he got involved with TNA, again, it's a really fascinating story. And if you're someone who, you know, is uh, someone who appreciates hard work and persistence and doing the right thing, you know, I think you'll relate to a lot of what Dave said as well, because every opportunity that he's got, he's earned it the hard way. And I, I can, I can say that for sure. Having, you know, known him to the extent that I have. Amazing. Yeah. I, I mean, because uh, TNA spent a lot of time in Florida. They were at Orlando Studios, weren't they? And uh, that's right. While. That's right. I think at that time, yeah. So obviously they were taping in Orlando, which was would have worked out quite nicely for him. Um, but he, he certainly had a lot of twists and turns along the way, different stints with TNA as well. Okay. Uh, and, and uh, you know, never really in a position to have a lot of job security, you know, and, and that that's one of the other things that comes up in the book as well. I, I won't go into too much detail because I'll sort of sure. give away a key, key part of the ending. But, yeah. you know, David was always in a position where, yes, he was a ring announcer, but he was he had his hand in a whole variety of aspects of the business. He was involved in the production end of the business. He did some talent relations. A lot of people don't know 
going back to the WCW days, that he was actually on the booking team right at the end of the company. So, you know, he was there in the room at a, at a level that, you know, even some of the bigger names associated with WCW weren't privy to. So uh, he has a very sort of well-rounded and holistic understanding of everything that was going on in the business at that time. So as you can tell, I'm I'm really excited about it and, you know, can't recommend it enough. So yeah, I, again, I think you guys will love it. Yeah, absolutely. We, like I said, we can't wait to, to dig into that. Um, mm. I want to switch gears for a second, Guy, and talk yep. about Nitro. Um, what made you want to, you know, do the deep dive on that? Wow, yeah, deep dive is right. As you as you held up earlier, I think it's a near 600-page book, yeah. <laughs> which is not, not what I anticipated going in. Um, look, I think you guys will relate to what I'm about to say, which is, you know, I think we're sort of around the same age and uh, you know, back then for us on on our side of the pond, of course, the wrestling, you know, phenomenon had hit us as well. And, you know, uh, you know, I can remember you know, being in high school at the time and everyone was watching at least the WWF, but in many cases, WCW as well. And, uh, you know, we certainly felt the, the wrestling boom. And I followed both companies very closely at that time. And it was, you know, a big part of my life for that that period of time. And after WCW went away, that was kind of the extent of my interest in wrestling for, for quite a while. Um, I did have an awareness of TNA and some of the other promotions that had started up, you know, post WCW. And of course, you know, anyone who's ever a fan of wrestling, and you guys will know this, you never fully divorce yourself from it, right? Because even if you're not watching it, you, you'll, you'll check the news sites, you'll, you, 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 you want to know what storylines are going on, so on and so forth. So you know, there was a period there where I was definitely keeping tabs of, of what was happening, but it wasn't until I think around 2009, 2010, when TNA, again, <laughs> there's TNA again for you, um, was ostensibly, I would argue, trying to restart the Monday Night Wars uh, when they were bringing in Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff. And of course, Ric Flair was part of that. It wasn't until around that time that I really started thinking about the Monday Night Wars era again. And it was around then, sort of 2010, that I started to go back, read some of the other books, uh, look at the documentaries that had been made at that point, and, and kind of do a, a deep dive or initial deep dive on the subject. And I find all of those uh, books and videos and so on to be entertaining and informative. But as someone who followed it so closely, I kind of felt felt myself thinking, yeah, that's not exactly how I remember it. Or, well, you know, I think they've missed out a key point here. Or, oh, th th there's some questions that have been left on the table that I think wrestling fans would like an answer to. And so it started as innocuous as that. Uh, you know, I, I sort of waited around for a while for someone to, you know, take the approach to the book, which that I wanted to see as a, as a fan and as a reader. And eventually, you know, when no one did, I said, well, let me have a, have a go at this. And um, that became a three and a half year odyssey. And, um, you know, it's, uh, actually been a, it, it sounds a, like a dramatic statement, but it's actually been very much a life changing experience for me doing this book It's sort of completely changed the trajectory of my life, uh, which was not expected or intended at all going in. So, um, so yeah, it, it turned into a huge project, but it really started as an honest attempt, I think, to try to get some answers and, and hopefully that's what the, the book delivers to people. For me, you know, not just because you're sitting here, guy. It's an incredible book. So, appreciate. I don't, yeah, I. I mean, yeah. Outside I of, think, tell, I outside think of anyone... telling everyone to go and buy it, yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It, it's fantastic book. Absolutely fantastic book. Well, thank awesome. you guys. That means a lot. Thank you. What What brought you together with Eric Bischoff for Grateful? Yeah, that that's an interesting story. That so, you know, of course, as you know, having read the book, Eric was one of the people that I interviewed for Nitro. I, I know the final number of interviewees is like north of 120. I think I lost count at that point, which is why people always say more than 120. I'd have to go back one day and actually add it all up and look at it, but you know, maybe I'll do that um, at some point. But Eric was, of course, one of those people. And the book, uh, you know, obviously wouldn't have been the same without his input because just imagine you're turning every page and you're you're reading about people referring to Eric Bischoff and what he did or what he didn't do, things he could have done better, et cetera. And without his input, the story would have been severely lacking. So I was very much indebted to him for agreeing to be interviewed. I think we spoke for 
about four and a half or five hours over a couple of different days for the book initially. And I really tried to ask him questions that I knew he hadn't been asked a million times already because we first made contact in 2015. And I don't, I'm sure you guys probably remember at that time, there was sort of a sense of there's nothing that could possibly be said anymore about the Monday Night Wars or the 90s era of pro wrestling in the States, right? Uh, I think it was 2014, the network launched. Of course, they had the Monday Night Wars series, 20-part series, and it's like, okay, we can firmly put that to bed now and move past it. There's nothing else that could possibly be said. And I think at that point, and I, not that I can get inside his head or anything, but my sense talking to Eric was he was a little bit tired of it as well, right? Because, of course any discussions about WCW are going to bring on, yes, some positive aspects, but also a fair share of negative ones as well. Um, so I really tried to focus on things that I knew he hadn't addressed ad nauseum in the past. And uh, it, it you know, turned out to be a really positive experience connecting with him. But I didn't really have a lot of interaction with him after that point until the book came out. And so I had no idea. I mean, of course, I knew he was going to read it at some point and respond to it, to, to it but... I had no idea as to the nature of that response. Was he going to go on his podcast and say, this is a bunch of bullshit, don't get it, <laughs> you know? Uh, I honestly had no idea. And so when he went on 83 weeks, a um, couple of months after the book came out with Conrad and basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said, look, there's some aspects of this which were quite difficult to read about myself, but overall, I've got to hand it to this book i mean it's what happened this this is the story this is as close as we're ever going to get to the story i was as blown away as anyone else you know and so um naturally at that point you know we sort of reconnected and um i met eric a couple of times in person we did a panel at the starcast convention that conrad organized um in vegas and i think after that convention um, or after that panel discussion we sort of talked about you know, if it makes sense, potentially there's a way that we can work together in the future. Shortly after that, Eric went back to WWE, which is sort of this uh, footnote now, which I think kind of gets lost to history. A lot of people don't even remember at this point that we're only talking about 2019 when, you know, Eric was was back in the fold and going to be the executive director of SmackDown and so on. And obviously that didn't last very long. But uh, at that point, I imagined that he would probably be there for a good few years and so i i sort of said you know what i think that book idea is uh on the back burner now but uh once that you know period uh came and went that's when we really started talking about doing something and the most um you know the 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 best opportunity i think for us to do that was to kind of pick up his story from his first autobiography which really kind of ends around 2005 2006 and and so that's what we did. We're grateful. Um, I always describe the book as, you know, the reason that we titled it Grateful is that's the place that Eric ended up in at the end of the book, right? He he ends up in this place where I think he's genuinely quite grateful that all of this happened to him. Um, but that's not to say that it's page after page of Kumbaya and, you know, he's floating on cloud nine and doesn't have a negative word to say about anyone. You know, I think if you enjoy Eric's, you know, rants and, you know, his ability to go off on people, there's a fair share of that as well. And again, we're going to circle back <laughs> for the fourth or fifth time to TNA. Uh, he goes into great detail about that whole experience. And so we don't circumvent or, or, or avoid any of that stuff. But I think the book ends in a very uplifting and, and nice place. And and it's kind of a, uh, a refreshing place, I think, given a lot of um, other wrestling books, you know, where people around Eric's age might be might find themselves in a little bit of a more, you know, negative mindset. And so, uh, so yeah, very proud of that book. Grateful. And, uh, you know, if you're a fan of Eric or not even a fan of him, I think you'll, you'll find a lot of value in him, uh, going over those, those kind of insane 15 years of his life since he left WWE the first time. Really looking forward to, to hearing about easy -E and, um, what mm. he, he, he did, um, at that time. I mean, again, he, he's, um, He's a character that is, he's a polarizing character, isn't he? Because, oh, yeah. you know, you either, especially in this sort of tribal time now where you've got sort of Eric not really pulling any punches with his views on AEW, he's become sort right. of a bit of a target 
um for AEW sort of tribalists and, and and whatnot. But when initially I think he was he was involved in AEW to a to a point. He was going to the the media scrums and stuff. I think he was was he not involved in some sort of part with well, that? He made he made some appearances, didn't he, on on AEW yeah. television? And yeah. he goes into that in the book as a particular chapter where he talks about you know how he got involved with AEW, what led to the breakdown, you know, of his um relationship you know with tony khan and as eric describes it you know it all centers around and i think it's sort of a, an infamous comment at this point that tony made as it relates to ted turner right where he went on social media one day and talked about and and we could look up exactly what he said i don't have it in front of me but sure. something something to the effect of you know if ted turner knew half as much as i knew about the wrestling business wcw never would have closed down and you know eric took particular offense to that for obvious reasons because yeah he felt that that was a, an ignorant statement to make given what actually happened to wcw but also disrespectful of ted and what i can say about eric in my time knowing him and i think you guys can probably tell this in listening to him as well he's genuinely an extremely loyal person and so i think for him you know ted turner was obviously an integral part of his life and he's going to he's going to stand by Ted Turner until the end. I mean, that's just the way that he is. That's the way that he's wired. And so um, I think that that comment, you know, really rubbed him the wrong way. And and that's what we go into in the book as well. And 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 after that point, he never made another appearance for AEW. And so that was kind of the genesis of it. He should have put the fucking gi back on, mate. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, maybe so. Maybe that's the way to settle it. <laughs> well, Tony's um, performing in the ring now. So, yeah, maybe we could have wow. uh, Eric Bischoff putting the gi back on versus Tony wow. Khan cracking. Yeah. <laughs> again, again, we were lucky enough to have, what was it, about an hour with Sonny Ono. Yeah. And he gave us like a real sort of, you know, very, very quick brief, but a, a really cool yeah. insight into, you know, what it was like working with Eric. And mm -hmm. like being around Eric around those times, and you know, including, you know, like it was a collision in career and stuff, and like it's right, yeah. We was, I mean, Eric's a, Eric's a fascinating guy, and he's someone like you know, you you can't help but listen to because he was so so damn you know successful for yeah. Even if they say it's for eighty three weeks, it's eighty three weeks longer than anyone else. Well, did it. it was yeah, it was so. even before that because even Sonny was mm. saying how. Um, Eric went in there and he started to sort of right some of the wrongs that WCW had done in the past with regards to the Japanese wrestlers. Yeah. And, mm. you know, how he, how he went in there and started to sort of make it more reciprocal rather than how it was before and ended up taking a bit of shit for that from the Japanese guys. And then, it, it, you know, it, it, it Sonny had some real good, nice things. And I'm sure they're still friends to this day. They might not sort of talk every day, but I mean, Sonny said, you know, we're still good buddies. You oh, know? they're very good friends. They're very yeah. good friends. Yeah. And, and it's funny, you know, Chris, you mentioned a few minutes ago, you described Eric as a polarizing character. And it's, it's funny that you say that because... In the book, that's exactly how he describes himself. He says, look, right. you know, I know that there's an equal amount of people who love me as there are hate me. That's the nature of it. It's not going to change. And he attributes that to the fact that he speaks his mind. And yeah. I think for those people who, you know, who listen to him and enjoy his shows, that's refreshing because, you know, in this day and age, there are um, a lot of instances, I think, where people pull punches or try to be protective of certain things or you know, yeah. maybe don't say exactly what they feel for fear that the the phone may not ring one day, for example. And, you know, he's not in a position where he needs the wrestling business per se, nor do I think that he would want to get involved in it at that level again. So I, I think he's at a point in his life where he can sit back and say exactly what he thinks about things. And um, again, similar to um, what we talked about earlier with, with Dave Penzer, many instances in Grateful as well, where Eric... Um, you know, holds up his hand and, and admits fault, even as it relates to TNA. You know, people may be expecting him to do nothing but, you know, dump on everyone else but himself as it relates to that whole time period, but that's not what he does at all. Um, and I and I think he's uh, quite specific in saying things he, you know, feels he could have done better. So um, I think to kind of put a button on it, you know, going back to the initial question, um, as it relates to to working with Eric, I just think that it's quite commendable 
you know, for someone to have read a book about a company that they were leading at one point and, you know, a company that they were an integral part of and come across, you know, large sections of the book that do not reflect particularly well on themselves, but still have the ability to say, yeah, that was tough to read, but you need to go out and get this book anyway, because this is actually what happened. Because if we're being honest, would we necessarily have that same perspective if we found out someone has, has wrote a book about a, a business or a company or a place that we worked at that maybe we were heavily involved in and there's some embarrassing stories in here about us and there's a lot of criticism here about us, would we have the ability to still say, you need to go out and read this book anyway? If we're being honest, I think we could all probably say that it's human nature to do the exact opposite. Yeah. And so that that's really, you know, what, sort of cemented um you know our ability to work together i think is that mutual respect and i and i just thought that was so commendable on his part because he could have gone on his podcast and tore the book to shreds and many many people never would have even looked into it for themselves you know they would have said well eric thinks it's a, a load of crap so i'm not even going to check out the book so you know I'm, I'm always just very grateful for that guy you are you are literally one of the i mean one of the biggest success stories of of our of our generation when it comes to wrestling and rock and you know wrestling books and such like i mean there are some other fantastic wrestling books out there and they're ones that we've read and ones that we haven't but i'm gonna hold this up again i love this i love this book sorry the light's getting light but like this is a cracking book and i can't really i i, I mean i can try and sell it for you even more but like it's, it's i mean i'm trying my best <laughs> it, it it's one it's one of those books that any wrestling fan of a, of a certain age, or even not even of a certain age, even people that are sort of wrestling fans now, or even older guys than that, you know, but I, even younger guys now that are watching the product now that don't even necessarily know about WCW. It would be it's, a fascinating learning tool for anyone wanting absolutely, to, to know about it. Because yes, we're so in a good. different we're in a different time now with wrestling. And mm -hmm. you know, that was the boom time of wrestling, really. I would say. I mm -hmm. mean, you people talk about the 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 golden era and stuff like that, but really, that that sort of mid nineties all the way through to mm -hmm. sort of two thousand and five. I mean, there wasn't really a time like it, man. It was wrestling was yeah. just it was booming, absolutely booming, right? Well, yeah. Again, I'll go back to, and this isn't necessarily the the sturdiest of metrics. This is more of a personal observation, but I just think about, you know, growing up during that time. And I, I remember a specific point in time where it seemed like everyone had some level of awareness about what was happening in wrestling. You know, yeah. they may not have been an Uber fan. They may not have been watching, you know, Raw and SmackDown every single week, but you could rattle off a, 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 a number of names from the roster and they would have, um, a decent level of understanding of what you were talking about. And so, you know, if you think about the significance of that, we're talking about a time that where the in, the internet was in its infancy. And so you had uh, a, a form of programming coming out in the States that was so popular and so powerful at that time that it, it even reached us in, in that way. Uh, because obviously there's, there's always been a following for wrestling in the UK, right? Go, going yeah. back many, many decades. And I think the WWF in particular always had a, a very uh, strong footprint in the UK as it relates to the the two different companies. But there was a time, you know, during that, that boom period that you mentioned there, Chris, where it, it, it transcended that. It wasn't just your typical wrestling fan who knew what was going on. It was, it was people that were more so inclined to follow, shall we say, for lack of a better word, you know, more legitimate <laughs> sports, right? Or, or yeah. uh, sports that aren't predetermined. And so um, I don't know if you're ever going to have a situation like that again, where it's that mainstream. Uh, and that's a whole other discussion we could get into one day about, you know, just how different things are these days and how fragmented, you know, popular culture has become. And of course, the technological changes and, you know, we could spend uh, 10 hours talking about that. But uh, but no, it, it's a time that I think a lot of people, myself included, and I'm sure you guys remember just just very fondly, uh, you know, for, for many, many reasons. And and hopefully some of that is is captured in the book as well, you know. Absolutely, man. Uh, I mean, it's it's been amazing having you on, Guy. Like Jordan says, you know, your, your writing's phenomenal. Um, you know, we're extremely excited about the um, your new bits and bobs that uh, have come out um, mm. and are, are due out. So you know, we, I think we're probably, you know, we're probably edged to probably have you on here again at some point. Um, I'll be to, happy to. 
you know, to talk more about you, um, actually, rather than your sort of um, your work, maybe um, talk about, you know, how you ended up in the States and, you know, your, your, mm. how you've got to where you are now. I mean, we would be absolutely honored if you'd come back on and do that with us guy. Absolutely guys. I, you know, would be more than happy to. And, you know, as I mentioned before we started recording, I know uh, David, you know, would be very happy to to speak with you and talk about his story also. So how about we, uh, we say, you know, after you get a chance to check out the new book, let's definitely do this again. Man, absolutely. Game on. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Game on. That is a deal, my friend. Um, guys, good. thank you so much for joining us. We know you are a little bit pressed for time today. You've got other commitments, so we will let you go. Um, we will say thank you. We really appreciate you joining us this evening. Um, for anyone that is looking to get a copy of Grateful with Eric Bischoff or you know, Nitro or sit in ringside with Dave Penza, you can go to guyevansbooks.com and you can, you know, just buy it from Guy himself. Buy it from himself so you don't have to go through those other companies that take their little pennies off his, they take, uh, you know, go directly to the guy right there and put all of the bucks in his pocket because (laughs) fuck me, the work that goes into these books is just, I mean, I'm sure, you know, Guy will tell us when he comes back on the amount of bloody interviewing, prepping, research. is just absolutely phenomenal. When you're writing books like Guy does, the amount of work that goes into them is absolutely phenomenal. So please, guys, um, you know, support these books because they are phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. So please go out and buy them. Well, let me just say in closing, guys, you know, when I hear some of your comments there, it, it, makes everything seem worth it. It makes me want to, you know, keep uh, coming out with with more books of this ilk. So I, I really appreciate everything you have to say and um, look forward to to listening to you guys in the future now, now that, um, now that you know, we've got a chance to meet. And you know, JB mentioned you've been doing this for four years. So that's, that's impressive in and of itself. So I'll be listening moving forward. So again, just thank you so much for having me on. Amazing, dude. Thank, thank you so you, much. Thank man. you, Guy. Take care, my friend. Appreciate it, guys. And there you have it. What a guy. What a guy. <laughs> um, what more can we say? We're extremely grateful for Guy Evans to join us and talk about, you know, these three books in, you know, in particular, the newest one, Sitting Rings Up yeah. with Dave Penza. If you're going to go and buy it, go and check it out on guyevans.com. Go and, you know, make sure the money goes to them. You know, Amazon don't need your money. Yeah, they don't. They take too much off authors, man. We've already said this on this show yeah. um, before, you know, if if you can go directly, because um, I think we've been blessed, dude, really. We've had some True. fantastic authors on this show. We've had, you know... Brian R. Solomon. Brian, Brian R. Solomon. Yeah. We've had, you know, um, yeah, John Elliot Finkel, Greenberg. Yeah, yeah Finkel. Amazing. You know, we've had some fantastic authors on this show. And, and Guy is just another fantastic author who has brought another he, he brought another aspect to to looking at the WCW situation with Nitro and it's um i think anyone that reads it understands that what a cracking job he did with it yeah. um you know absolutely phenomenal stuff and we we've just been lucky to to have people like Brian and um Keith and you know uh John and now Guy on the show we've had four yeah. fantastic authors on um all in their own way just absolutely fantastic so you know, we are, we I, I would say we're the thinking man's podcast, you we'd know, like, we're not, we'd like to <laughs> think so. Yeah. We like to think so. <laughs> you know, we're a little bit more cultured. We have authors on, um, you know, but we do it because we love to read. I, I was going to say, you know, next time we have guy on, I'd like to go through a few books that I've got. I mean, I've, we've, we've, we've myself and yourself have got a whole, you know, plethora of wrestling books that we've read over the years. You know, I've got them all down here. You know, anything, I've got the Jericho books. I've got the Danielson books, the biographies and all that. And then, you know, I've got the Bret Hart one. But I've also got ones like the Dungeon of Death and, you know, Wrestle Crap and Wrestling Babylon and all that sort of shit. You know what I mean? So you've got your your, your books that every wrestling fan sort of has. But, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's just fantastic to have guys like Guy on. Um, because you know the wrestling world is 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 different. You got your what you see on the screen, and you've got what is happening backstage, and then you've also got what's happening in the individual wrestlers' lives. Um, you know, and the people running it. It's so fucking intertwined and and complicated. And when you've got guys writing books like that, 
um, the amount of research. I mean, even John Finkel was talking about the amount of research that go, yeah. went into the yeah, Macho Man right. Randy Savage book. You know, the the people he was interviewing the Bonets. You know, people who you know, you know, people that played baseball with him in fucking high school and shit. You know, like the amount of research that goes into it and hard work and you know a lot of the times it will be years and years and years of work going into this book so guys go out buy these books buy get nitro get you know get um the uh penza book get get the eric bischoff book um go and do that and um yeah, help these guys time. out keep them keep them working you know because yeah. if you if you buy the books He'll keep writing the books. He's told That's us right. already. <laughs> so. That's right. So before we go, we need to talk about Rafe Energy. It's, we got to do it. Like Now, a little personal story from me, and this is this is just me. This isn't anyone else. This isn't something that's been endorsed by anyone else or anything like that. <laughs> uh, on Saturday, I came down quite ill. Saturday, you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, you know. So from about Monday, I decided to, you know, I wasn't really eating, drinking too much. You do, you do that when you're ill. You stay in bed. You don't really get much going i decided yeah. to make sure i had a proper drink in me so i've made sure i took i had wraith i had some wraith and i'll be honest it did it perks you it perks you up but you know it's got the antioxidants the amino acids you know a little bit of caffeine 200 mm -hmm. milligrams as far as i'm aware yep and it did it did perk me up it did i'm not going to say it helped me get over a cold or anything like that because that would be that would be you know ridiculous but <laughs> it did it helped me get out of bed but the, but this is the thing when you've the, those cold and flu medicines that you get they've all got a bit of caffeine in yeah they have. Do you know what I mean so then if you're taking a fucking a lem sip or something like that um all it is is sort of paracetamol and caffeine but with yeah. rafe if you pop a couple of paracetamol have a rafe you've got your caffeine there but also like jb says you've got your amino acids you've got all the stuff there for your brain and you've got water as well so you're yes, hydrating lots yourself of water and i was very well you know? hydrated during that time and like I said, I'm not gonna. It's not. It's not a science. It's you know. It's being smart, <laughs> making sure you, you know, have a drink. Make sure you have got your fluids in you. But sticking something like Rafe Energy in just to keep you going, even when you're not feeling so good. Yeah. You know, it worked for me. And that's that's you know, it's a personal story, and that's me. Like, and you know, I'm no, I'm not 100, percent but I'm here sitting talking to everyone right now. So, right, can't complain. Can't, so get on that Wraith. They've got fantastic flavours. You've got Mojito. You've got Gamer Bath Water. You've got Slayer Mango. You've got all sorts, man. Oh, I, so I, I, lived, I lived on the cola flavour this week. It's just has One of my be. buddies told me the cola flavour was fantastic as well. He said yeah. the Colt Cola, Colt cola cracking flavour. Yeah, yeah I, mate. I, that, that kept me going. So, of course, you can check it out in the description there will be there is a link use the code grapple get 10 percent off your order and you know keep yourselves going get keep that energy up get your caffeine fi fix your amino acids and your antioxidants good shit good shit baby so, absolutely so yeah go to the link in the description click the link use the promo code grapple you get 10 percent off um, help uh, help the brothers out right here and help yourself out by getting some extremely good product with a bit of a discount just to help you out in these uh, times we're wearing yeah. at the moment. So, Sunax Britain fam. You know Sunax I mean? Britain indeed. So thank you <laughs> very much to everyone that's still here, still listening and watching. Hit the subscribe button, tickle that bell if you must. If you're listening, five stars, Tokyo Dome style, go for it. Absolutely. And yeah, what else can we say for now? I'm JB. Next to me, the best Chris in all of wrestling podcasts, Mr. Chris Dredd. We oh. thank Guy Evans for his time. Guys, we'll see you next time. Peace.